If you are a fan of history and you've played EO4 for enough hours that you pretty much got fed up with the base game, I highly recommend you guys try out Imperium Universalis. This mod takes us back all the way to 612 BC up until 218 BC which is when the Punic Wars happened, well the second Punic War happened and it is really a treasure trove of historical knowledge. Granted some of the stuff has been filled in by the mod creators because honestly there's not that much information on certain areas of the world from back then and it's just you know you have to fill in a lot of the things with assumptions and with whatever information they might have gotten but I have to say that I'm actually quite impressed with the amount of uh, accuracy that this mod has overall and I want us to explore a little bit these start dates for Imperium Universalis together because I think we're gonna have a little bit of fun doing so to get an idea of what the world was like back then compared to the world that we have today and compared to the 1444 start date of U4. Also guys, if we get 5,000 likes, I'm gonna use this mod to recreate Alexander the Great's historical conquests of the Persian Empire and see if I can do a better job than a uh, good old Alexander or if I'm just gonna have to throw in the towel. I think that would be a little bit of fun, wouldn't it? And hey, if you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing. I'm trying to reach 170,000 subs by the end of April. I'm kind of losing hope on that because it's fast approaching and I'm pretty far from it, but consider it if you enjoy the content I, I would really appreciate it very much and I also want to mention I'm working on my very first dedicated historical video on the Battle of Varna because we reached our like goal on one of my previous videos it's taking a little bit of time because I'm actually using proper historical references I'm reading up on various books about the particular battle and trying to make the most accurate depiction of the battle as possible but I will be posting some early access stuff for the video on my patreon so if you're interested in it consider becoming a patron as well it would really mean the world to me it would support the channel so much more and of course for channel members too we will have on the community post now you probably noticed that in the Italian peninsula there's not any sort of a Roman Republic slash uh, Empire here that's because in 612 or 142 ad Urbe Condita, which means from the founding of the city of Rome, because that is how the Roman Empire kept track of its own time. It was from the establishment of the city. It was not from the birth of Jesus Christ, which was not born in, obviously, 612 BC, i.e. before the birth of Christ. <laughs> and in 612, the Roman Kingdom, because that's right, from the founding of the city of Rome in 753 up until 510 or 509 depending on, well, depending on sources, really. A lot of the stuff that we have from the Roman Kingdom period is oral stuff passed down and written down much later down the line. So some historical information is not as accurate as it could be. But we do know the names of all seven Roman legendary kings. I don't know if I should call them legendary. So the first one obviously is Romulus who built the city after he um, committed fratricide. He killed his own brother, sacrificed his own brother. It's it's a more of a legend but there's definitely some lesson to be learned from that particular legend. Then after Romulus we have uh, Numa Pompilius followed by Tullus Hostilius, Ancus Marcius, Tarquinius Priscus, Servius Tullius, and Tarquinius Superbus, the last Roman king. After which the Roman Republic was established up until Octavian Augustus became the first Roman Emperor after the second triumvirate he took care of Marcus Antonius but yeah in this period Tarquinius of Rome as apparently he's called in um in this particular game was of Etruscan culture funny fact about this his original name apparently was Lucumo at least that's what Levi says since Levi is one of the main sources we have on this particular king from this particular period period and he was originally from the Etruscan parts of uh, the Italian peninsula I guess. He is also known as one of the early expanders of Rome because during his reign the city of Rome actually expanded starting the foundations of what would eventually become a Roman hegemony in the Italian peninsula via the uh, Roman Republic because during the kingdom period they didn't have much of a hegemony but they were still pretty significantly strong after Tarquinius came to power. Another fun fact about the kings of Rome is that it was not actually hereditary even though previously Ancus Marcius was actually the grandson of Numa Pompilius, the second king of Rome. It was actually the 
Comitia Curiata that chose or elected the kings of Rome. So it's a really interesting system. It's kind of a foundations of its own type of individual republic, isn't it, end of the day? Because once the Roman Republic was established, you still kind of had kings in the shape of dictators or tyrants based on, you know, the amount of time they were on the throne, really. And those guys also were essentially elected by the Senate. Anyway, I've talked a little bit too much about Rome. Obviously, I am a big Roma book here, but the reality is that in 612, the big action was happening in Assyria. Now, in this game, Assyria is called Assyria. However, historically speaking, we distinguish Assyria in 612 BC from the previous Assyria because there was a discontinuation in this particular area. And we call this the Neo Assyrian Empire, which is, of course, distinguished from the old Assyrian Empire, just like the Babylonians had their old period, a new period. After this particular war, the uh, capital of Assyria, Nineveh, was destroyed by a coalition of Babylonians, Sasonians, and even some Scythian tribes, and Medes and a few other peoples around here. Media basically being a precursor to the various Persian empires that got established in this area eventually. And to be fair, in this game, I think they do a really good job at depicting that. We do have Babylonia, Media, some Scythian tribes that were with the Assyrians. I would definitely add Sosun, which is one of the most important cities in this area, in this period. Sosonians actually going to war with the Assyrians provided a lot of support. The city of Susun contributing a sizable contingent of troops in the assaults against the Assyrians. And after the uh, fall of Nineveh and the death of Ashur, the second to last Assyrian king, the Babylonians established themselves as the ruling empire in this particular area. Albeit, yes, I know what some of you Historia boos in the chat are gonna say now. Yo, these are not technically empires, so stop calling them that. Well, they're kind of like that, all right? It depends on which books you reference and how you actually define an empire. Let's just call them Roto Empires. Now, the thing that really makes a huge difference in this particular mod for me is the fact that they've actually scripted in all of this stuff, and you have a sizable chunk of the world. You actually have all the way into Zhu. By the way, Zhu at this point in the campaign, let me see if I can find it. It should be very, very small here. There we go. Found it, boys. Zhu right here would be um, one of the early incarnations of a unified China. Obviously, it only conquered parts of China, not the entirety. It's funny how uh, this guy here, which we know as King Kuang of Zhu, and originally, yes, his birth name was uh, Ji Ban, managed to go from being a march or basically a tributary of Jin to its own massive independent and hegemonic kingdom in the northern bits of China eventually. That being said, the Qin dynasty actually gave us the name of China from Qin China and Qin, namely the great emperor of Qin, Qin Shi Huang or Ying Zheng as his actual name was, was the one that properly unified China for the first time with only smaller bits of the southern tip of the Chinese area not actually being incorporated within the Chinese state itself. But Zhu played its part much, much earlier. This is 400 years difference right here essentially, right? The first Qin emperor also being the one that made the terracotta army that is basically the most famous thing everybody knows about China aside from the Great Wall, right? I've uh, fast forwarded the timeline here a little bit. We are now in 499 BC or 255 Ad Urbe Condita and you can probably see on the map that the Persian Empire is at the doorsteps of uh, Greece. This is pretty much the uh, historically accepted time when the Greco-Persian Wars happened, well started happening. It lasted for a very long time. If you guys are interested in uh, this particular period, I highly recommend a book called The Greek and Persian Wars by Philip Souza. It's basically a little bit of a summary about what happened in this period, in this time frame, this hundred something years of wars between the Persians and the Greeks. And it illustrates how the Greeks went from a disunited pack of uh, city-states here to a coalition, let's call it, that unified to fight against the uh, vile Persians, taking them back considerably with Alexander the Great hundred something years later, there you go, or Alexander the third as we know him because Alexander the first of Macedon would be in this time period, Alexander Argiad the first. And yes, he was a vassal of Persia. Tracia was a satrapy of Persia. The Persians actually managed to make it all the way into Dacia. There are historical records about the Dacians and the Persians clashing into each other, which is kind of insane. Like, I, I, I personally, I'm from basically this city over here, right? There is a small chance that the Persians actually might have even been to my city, what, like 
2,500 years ago, 2,400 years ago. And even though all of these various uh, entities like Phrygia, Cappadocia, Hellespontine Phrygia, Caria, Kilikia, etc. are not Persia directly, the Persians ruled this area directly. These were satrapies, essentially kind of like vassals, tributaries, whatever you want to call them. They were satrapies. They had different administrative uh, functions, but that's a story for another time. The point is that they all paid tribute to Persia and they all kind of belonged to Persia all the way into here. Persia, Libya, Orientalis, essentially Egypt was also a part of the Persian Empire. If we go to the diplomatic map mode, look at this. That's how massive the Persian Empire was in this time period. And even though we don't actually have historical records for this particular area in uh, Qatar, in the Qatari Peninsula, in Bahrain and all of this uh, fringes here, it is to be assumed that this also was a part of Persia. It would make sense for the Persians since it was at their doorstep to either make these areas tributaries or to directly own them. The thing is though that this area was predominantly Bedouin migrating tribes so whatever settlements were here it's likely that the people migrated from one area to another based on the available resources and so on. So that's why it's pretty hard to actually get any information from there. We do have accounts though of Gerha actually getting attacked by the Persians and according to the Persian sources they did conquer the eastern coastline of Gerha. I am going to put the uh, conquer in between quotations. Like I said, <laughs> these were Bedouin migrating uh, camel riding boyos. I highly doubt that they had too many settlements. Albeit Bahrain was 100% a settled uh, area. It was a settled island and it was directly owned by uh, the Persians. The Achaemenids did conquer Bahrain. Meanwhile, in the Italian peninsula, we can see here that Rome still didn't do much nipple dorp around it, but it did start getting alliances and it was a republic at this point. We passed time a little bit more. We start seeing them expand a little bit by little bit. Look at that. They got the coastline in just 10 years and then after another 10 years they expand even more and more and more. The warmongering Romans are starting to show their true nature, aren't they? Within the next 100 years by 605 ad urbe condita, they already established themselves in the entirety of the Mediterranean with most of the Spanish lands being theirs. But let's uh, roll this back a little bit, shall we? Because yes, this was a really quick expansion. But during the period of the Greco-Persian War, Rome, compared to its uh, future rival of Carthage, was insignificant. In fact, the Carthaginians in 255 Adurbe Condita considered the Romans and all the other tribes in the Italian peninsula as barbarians. They pretty much only considered civilized nations, the Greek city-states established around the Italian peninsula, with the Latin tribes and the Etruscan tribes having trade and diplomatic relations with the Carthaginians, but they never took them serious and they always considered them as second grade civilizations to be dealing with. Kind of ironic considering that the Carthaginians would eventually get completely wiped out by the small little insignificant Roman city. Well, at least uh, 255 standards insignificant, right? Kind of makes me wonder as well, like, how is the world going to be in 500 years from now or, or 200 years from now? Maybe Romania, the most insignificant country in Europe, is going to establish a massive empire, restore the Roman Empire, and everyone's going to be speaking Latin again, okay? That's what's gonna happen. It's just, it's just an idea. It's, it's probably not gonna happen unless we got 200,000 subs by the end of the year and I established the Roman Empire IRL by becoming the president of Romania, destroying corruption in that country, reforming the army, reforming the institutions, creating a union of Latin speaking nations. There's no Latins. Calm down, calm down, CIA operative watching this. Stop taking notes. I've skipped over to Alexander the Great's period because I want to see exactly how the game depicts or the mod depicts picks the world of Alexander the Great. So, okay, we have knowledge of the entirety of the Mediterranean. That is accurate. In fact, the Greeks did have, historically, a huge colonial empire around the Mediterranean. That being said, it was not like a colonial empire, as in modern terms. It was colonial empire in the sense that there were various Greek tribes that settled all around and formed colonies around the Mediterranean, like the ones in uh, Massalia was one of the most uh, famous ones, being an Ionic Greek colony. Remember that that, uh, the Greeks had different tribes that migrated in the Greek peninsula eventually and then they spread around the Mediterranean afterwards amongst which the Dorians, Ionians and so on. Let's check the culture map mode. Oh, that is beautiful. Look, you can actually see the various Greek cultures, Ionian colonies pretty much all around the Mediterranean. The Ionians definitely did colonize a schnapps ton and of course the Italian colonies basically like, you know, it's like a breed of Italians mixed in with Greeks. I don't know. It's kind of a thing that the mod created there, to be fair. Epirates, yes. Macedonians.
Macedonians is of course Aeolic. This is one of the um, original tribes, the Aeolics. Macedonians are different because reality is that Macedonians were a mixture between Thracians and Greeks. They did speak Greek, by the way, or a version of Greek, uh, probably a dialect of Greek, Macedonian Greek, and were Greeks, but they did have influences from the Thracians and the historical origin of Macedon, the kingdom of Macedon is Greeks that essentially conquered Thracian lands and educated the barbarian Thracians, made them basically Greeks in a way. But that being said, through history, we have multiple accounts in which the Greek city-states considered Macedonians as barbaric, which is funny because those barbarians eventually unified Greece for the first time, my boys. I.e., you know, that guy Alexander we got over here right now. We also have the Doric. Doric is uh, predominantly in the southern tip of Greece here, the most famous of which the Spartans were Doric, and the Spartans originate from Crete. They invaded from Crete in the southern tip of uh, the Greek peninsula, and for the entirety of Sparta's existence, they considered themselves as invaders or people of a higher status when compared to the regular non-descended from the original invaders from the island of Crete. That's kind of why the uh, Spartans died out, because they never had the manpower to match the vastly numerically superior city-states around them because of the whole exclusion and you have to have the specific bloodline from all the way back when we invaded you boys otherwise you're just another schnapple dude. Well that caught up with the Spartans and when the amount of population increased which is natural obviously they got outnumbered and they got crushed and became an insignificant bleep in uh, later history I guess. The lesson we got to take from that is that if you do the pee pee time you win. That's it. That's that's all you got to take from that. Now Macedonia, obviously, because we're a little bit down the line in the uh, mods time frame, 200 years down the line, we start with the uh, admin, diplo, and military tech 20. And check it out, guys. We can see here how many institutions exist. That is insane. We start with elephant domestication, writing system, coinage, bureaucracy, siege engineering, cast iron, civil laws. Oh my god, that's a lot of freaking institutions. Monotheism being one of the last ones. Well, hold up a second, my boys, because I'm pretty sure the Judeans were monotheistic, as were the Zoroastrians, the religion that likely had a little bit of an inspiration on Judaism. Let's just say that Zoroastrians and Jews, or Abrahamic religions in general, have a lot of similarities, including the fact that they have one deity that they worship, or deity that they worship. There's a lot of 12 this, 12 that spread around in both religions as well, and a lot of very similar origin stories for certain individuals. But I digress, that's not the point of this video here. So the cool part is that Byzantion, as well as other city-states around this area, are of course our culture. So if we were to start as Macedonia here, if we get that light goal by the way, we should have a fairly easy time at least keeping in check the uh, coastlines of the Anatolian Peninsula. It's gonna be a little bit tougher with uh, conquering inwards, but we can also just make our own satrapies, right, like the Persians did. I'm gonna let the AI fight this out a little bit. I'm curious to see how it performs. Let's start the war. Declare war. Get away for one month? Okay. Oh, I I forgot that there's an actual population system in this mod. So instead of having the development that you have in the base game, you actually have pops that grow passively. You have tribal population, commoners, urban class, and the general amount of population. It's similar a little bit to Imperator Rome, let's say. They also did the sprites very well. There's a lot of uh, new buildings as well. Look at the building system is absolutely brilliant, man. They've put a lot of work into this and it's not just like flat modifiers, this and that. They've actually taken the time to balance this out to make it viable if you planning on having a 400 years playthrough with this particular mod. Suffice to say, there's a ton of decisions, including forbidding human sacrifice. Well, why would you ever do that? Come on, guys. Ban debt slavery. Oh, 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 we need this today, don't we, boys? And I have to say, the Cult of Zeus giving 10% infantry combat ability and shock damage is a huge deal here. It's really gonna help out the Macedonians against the, um, the Phrygians, I guess, first. Looks like Persia's not joining. That should be easy for them. I'm gonna just fire this off so they start their own little war and I'm gonna go into observer mode. All right, let's see how it goes. Performance wise, I have to say that it does lag a little bit at times. It's not as laggy as you would imagine though. It's actually performing a hundred times better than Voltaire's Nightmare, for example, which is a very CPU intensive, let's call it, uh, mod for EU4. Okay, they clearly have some uh, sort of bonuses here for sieging down stuff because they already went to 21% after just a few. Oh, oh, that went down to seven. All right, never mind. Guess they uh, removed the fleet that was was blockading this. Yes, they did. They came back again. And that fell at 21%. Of course, AI 
guy always takes stuff at 21 and 7 percent cannot be more than that right boys totally unrelated but this makes me think of star trek and how they have the simulator room where you can basically see historical stuff maybe in the future we'll be able through somehow to either travel back in time or simulate it and watch historical events happen irl whilst we're basically like some sort of a ghost and just watching everybody and they don't see us that would be so awesome probably not gonna happen that's a massive long shot isn't it but i would just love to be one of those guys that watches alexander the great conquer everything around him and to just watch the brilliant of his uh, strategic mind come to play in person doesn't surprise me that two of the great powers right now are in india magadha and avanti with persia of course being number one followed later down by carthage macedon chu in china as well chi in china and another indian ashmaka kind of goes with the territory when your continent or subcontinent has a huge amount of population doesn't it oh damn chu is massive i just realized these guys were not easy for chin to take out because historically chin destroyed chu they absolutely schnapple duped them they wiped the floor with chu i guess you could say they went achoo and they disappeared that's that's exactly what happened historical 101 right there i'm not sure if they did any ai improvements but i'm noticing that the attackers are actually focusing on the fortifications and they're focusing on vital areas and high development areas maybe it's just a coincidence but oh my god okay yeah yep macedon just doubled in size right there that is absolutely amazing they've quite literally doubled in size <laughs> what all right well i guess um i guess it's not going to be as hard for me to uh, conquer persia as i initially thought it would be when i do that playthrough if we get the light go lordy stop it. You asked five times for this. Stop it, Ludi. It's too much now. All right, I'm sorry, okay? Fine. You happy now? I also wanted to draw attention to Imperium Universalis because the mod team did put a huge amount of work into this mod. I'm guessing thousands of hours spent researching stuff and just coding all of this stuff. And it would be a total waste if you guys didn't play Imperium Universalis since it's such a well-fleshed out mod. It really feels like its own game based off of EU4. Of course, if you play EU4, you're 100% going to know how to play this. There's not much of a difference in the base game mechanics minus the population system which is different from the dev system in eu4 but just the different setting and the amount of diversity that you have with this mod makes it so much more fun and just extremely enjoyable so i recommend you guys check it out i'll, I'll leave a link in the description now if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like these let me know in the comments also i would love to make more historically themed e4 videos like this what if e4 started one day early video right over here and i want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons channel members and twitch subscribers i would not be able to do this without all your support 